Hello everyone and welcome to the Daily Signal's Top 10. Today we're counting down the top news stories of the week, many of which have gone either misreported or underreported in the mainstream media. I'm Jenny Maltabano, and here with me to break all of this down is my colleague at the Daily Signal, Jarrett Stepman. He's also the co-host of the podcast Right Side of History with our White House correspondent, Fred Lucas. Jarrett, thanks for joining me. Well, thank you for having me on. It's Easter weekend, so we had a bit of a tough time filling the third spot, so it's going to be the Jenny and Jarrett show today. It is. I'm excited. Any fun plans for Easter? Well, I, I do have some fun plans for Easter. Um, I'm going to do a little Sunday brunch on Easter Sunday at Mount Vernon, at George Washington's home, which is it's one of my favorite places in the whole world. And we're gonna, I'm gonna do a little brunch there with my wife and visit some friends. So hopefully it'll be a nice Easter Sunday. That sounds wonderful. I'm gonna be watching some baseball. We talked on the podcast yesterday about this. I've got the Astros, you've got the A's. We both had good opening days. We did. We both had good opening days. And you know what? Even though they play in the same division, I definitely admire the Astros and winning the World <laughs> Series last year. So uh, definitely excited to have baseball finally back. Finally, it's back. All right. Now to start off, number 10, we've got David Hogg versus Laura Ingram. Check it out. At our latest count, there's been seven advertisers that have pulled out of Laura Ingram's show after one tweet from you. I mean... It seems like you have a lot of power at the moment, and I'm just wondering how you feel about all of this. I think it's great that corporate America is standing with me and the rest of my friends because when you come against any one of us, whether it be me or anybody else, you're coming against all of us. And I think it's important that we stand together as both corporate and civic America to take action against these people and show them that they cannot push us around, especially when we're, all we're trying to do here is save lives. And when people try to distract like Laura's trying to do right now from what the real issue here is, which is gun violence in America, it's not only sad, it's just wrong. From a journalistic standpoint, I would say that she needs to be more objective and needs to stand down because I am not the issue here. The issue needs to be gun violence in America, but what she's trying to do is to distract from that, and I hate it. So I'm sure most of our viewers are familiar with David Hogg. He is a Parkland survivor who has been lionized by the left. He's very adamant in support of gun control. He's also made some pretty vicious attacks against Marco Rubio. And now, uh, Laura Ingram did issue an apology to him. Jarrett, what do you make about all of this? I mean, uh, good on Laura Ingram for kind of, you know, taking the higher step and saying, I'm I'm going to apologize, you know, attacking the kid over his grades or getting into schools wasn't necessarily the best thing in the world. But then, of course, Hogg comes back and basically says, apology not accepted until you accept all of my claims here, until you go against your own network, until you be objective, which I think is very funny from a guy who's basically an activist, who calls himself, I guess, a, a student journalist, who's kind of turned to activism on his own. It, it's, a funny, it's a funny narrative for him. And, you know, it might have been better if he had just said, hey, apology accepted, let's move on from this, we have different points of view, we'll be civil with mm -hmm. each other, we have disagreements. But again, as you said, this is somebody who called Senator Marco Rubio, basically said he had blood on his hands for taking money from the NRA, even though you know there are a lot of American citizens who back the NRA and believe in that. So it is kind of an absurd thing for Hogg to essentially say, Apology not accepted. Right, and a lot of people say, you know, maybe Hogg went a little bit too far on this. She did apologize. Why not move on? It makes him seem not very genuine. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think he does seem to be, you know, I think it, it lacks a genuineness. I mean, it makes it seem like, oh, he's just being an activist. He's not treating uh, Laura Ingram as just, you know, another person who says something and maybe made a mistake. She said she made the mistake. She, she fessed up to this. She said, I'm sorry. You know, time for Easter. We, you know, we should be more forgiving and things like that. And he just basically said, no, accept all my claims. Uh, basically, your show is bad and it's not objective. Mm -hmm even though he's an activist. So I, I do think it's a bit ridiculous that he's kind of continued this, this kind of debate and this kind of, I don't know, butting heads mm -hmm. with Laura Ingram. And he's an activist who is avoiding a debate with Kyle Kashev, who is a pro-Second Amendment survivor, so we'll certainly keep an eye on this. But now on to number nine. Roseanne is back, and she's a Trump supporter. Watch this. How could you have voted for him, Roseanne? He talked about jobs, Jackie. He said he'd shake things up. Oh, have you looked at the news? Because now things are worse. Not on the real news. And apparently President Trump did call the cast and gave a congratulations because their ratings were off the chart. Jarrett, what do you think? Yeah, it's interesting. I think there were a lot of people that 
obviously have gravitated to the show, and I think part of it's nostalgia. This is an early 1990s program that a lot of people remember very fondly. I was I was not a watcher of Roseanne. I, it wasn't a show that it was on my list, but I think it does get to something, though, that, look, I mean, we see so many other shows about families that tend to be a little more urban, tend to be a little more maybe upper middle class, things like this. This is a working class family, and, and this is a family from, from middle America, and I think people are so craving something a little different than what we see from Hollywood all the time. I mean, so it feels like things are kind of pushed down our throat, Hollywood values, that there was something a little different. Now, I wouldn't call it a conservative show. I wouldn't say that the values pro uh, proposed there are conservative, mm -hmm. but it is something different. It shows how hungry American audiences are for something different. And it says a lot that so many viewers checked into this thing that people are interested. They want something a little different from Hollywood, from the media. I think you touched on something very important there, that there is an appetite in America for more shows that are more center or right of center. I know Eric Boeing, the former Fox News host, had a great tweet the other day about late night talk shows and how why don't we have someone who's a bit more conservative because the viewership is certainly there. Do you think there's a possibility for that? Absolutely. I think, that, I think there is. And I think, you know, certainly Certainly the bottom line for a lot of these networks is going to come calling and they're mm -hmm. going to say, look, there's a huge audience of Americans who we're not reaching before. Why not reach out to them? Why not have a show that shows their lives or shows something that they can relate to more than what we normally see from Hollywood? There's enormous opportunity, not just for this Roseanne show, but for other shows in the future to say, there's a big audience. We're gonna, we want to make money. We want something a little different, something you know that you're not used to seeing. Let's go with that. It will be interesting to see who takes a risk on this. All right, number eight, President Trump is vowing that the Second Amendment will not be repealed. Now, this was in response to a New York Times op-ed calling for the repeal of the Second Amendment. Here's what he said. Very important and respected in some circles, Democrat, said we want to get rid, we should get rid of our Second Amendment. In other words, get rid of it. That's really uh, good steer. Could be right about that. So we're going to protect our Second Amendment. That's not going to happen. We have the best judges. We put on a tremendous amount of great federal district court judges. We'll be setting records. We are setting records. Uh, appeals court judges. Uh, Supreme Court judge, fantastic, Justice Gorsuch. And we'll continue. But your Second Amendment will always be your Second Amendment. We're not doing anything to that. Not doing anything. So that was President Trump defending the Second Amendment during an infrastructure speech that he gave earlier this week. Jared, what do you think? You just did a great interview with David Harsani, a senior editor at The Federalist, who is writing a book about guns in America and the history of it, which is something that liberals a lot of time forget, that there is precedent, there is strong reason in the Constitution. It's not about hunting. Yeah, that, that's definitely a narrative that's out there all the time that, you know, guns are just about hunting. But they're really, they stem from something different. They stem from the natural right of self-defense. They, they, they stand for defending our communities and our country. I mean, this is why, I mean, our revolution was born with Americans armed with guns fighting against a tyrannical government. So there are many facets that go into why we support the Second Amendment. And I have to say... You know, look, I don't think the Second Amendment's going away anytime soon. I know we had this, this big article in the New York Times by a former Supreme Court Justice, John Paul Stevens, saying, let's get rid of the Second Amendment. I don't think Americans are going to back that now. I don't think, I think that if there's one thing that's not going to go away anytime soon, it is the Second Amendment. It has such widespread support. But at the same time, I think the actual right to self-defense even goes beyond the Second Amendment. Even if for, by some, for some reason, we're able to repeal the Second Amendment. The right to self-defense is a natural right. It's something that is the founders would have understood, something that cannot be deprived from the citizens. So I think that, you know, and there was a great article about this in The Federalist mm -hmm. uh, that basically said, hey, even if they take away the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms still exists. This is a natural right, not just something based in the positive law. And I think a lot of Americans believe in that. Right, and what I've seen with all of this is a tremendous amount of hypocrisy. Now, you were on the ground for March for Our Lives. Well, you had a lot of tweets coming at you saying, basically, you're overblowing this. No one's calling for repeal of the Second Amendment. Well, then this New York Times op-ed comes out. But you also saw signs during the march that we're advocating for just that. Absolutely. I mean, I, I couldn't believe the kind of the level of attacks on the Second Amendment, basically signs saying, 
confiscate guns. There was one that said, oh, I wish Obama had taken your guns away. There was one that said, oh, these are 18th century laws for 21st century weapons. And, of course, I think it's a funny thing saying mm -hmm. that when they're exercising their right of assembly, which is based in an old 18th century mm -hmm. law. So we obviously don't take away rights based on the fact that, well, these laws were made a long time ago. So I saw a lot of that there. And it gets to what you're saying is that, there are a lot of people who simply don't believe the narrative that people aren't trying to take away all the guns. Because, look, if we're to believe the people, especially on the left, who say that guns are the problem, why does that only apply to AR-15s? Why is it now applied to that next step, which is handguns? I mean, handguns are used in more, more of these mass shootings have been committed with handguns mm -hmm. than AR-15s. Why isn't that next step going to be taken? And I think there are a lot of people that say, I just don't trust them. I don't trust the other side to protect my Second Amendment rights. I see all these signs. I hear even somebody's esteemed as a Supreme Court justice who was upset that he didn't get the right decision in a case dealing with the Second Amendment saying now get rid of the Second Amendment. That's a pretty chilling thing for Americans who believe in this right to bear arms. It's extremely chilling and one of the speakers at the March for Our Lives last Saturday said something along the lines of you know they're gonna give us an inch so we're going to take a mile. So they kind of frame this as right-wing paranoia but it's actually a very legitimate concern. Yes, absolutely. I think you've seen this kind of battle that happens with some members of the media who generally favor gun control, like to keep the narrative straight that, oh, they just want common sense restrictions. But you see this base behind them that wants way more than that, and it cracks through the surface. So when people hear, when people who believe in the Second Amendment, NRA members, people who have guns, hear common sense restrictions, they hear somebody saying, well, I'm going to take an inch, then I'm going to take a little more, and then take a little more, and pretty soon we're going to have confiscation mm -hmm. of firearms. And there's a reason why people are now signing up in mass to join the NRA, why they're giving their donations to, to the NRA, to these other organizations that support guns. You know, the narrative out there from the left is that the NRA is the reason we have all these, uh, we're against all these gun control laws. But the truth is, there are a lot of people who support the NRA and what it's doing. And that is their real power. Absolutely. And you've been doing great work on this. You have several articles out, several great interviews on podcasts. I would encourage everyone to check them out. Now, number seven, Hillary Clinton is back and she's saying no one ever told a man to go away after an election. Take a look. I was really struck by, um, how people said that to me, go away, go away. They never said that to any man who was not elected. Al Gore didn't stop talking about climate change, and I'm really glad that John Kerry uh, went to the Senate and became an excellent Secretary of State, and I'm really glad John McCain kept uh, speaking out and standing up and saying what he had to say. Um, and for heaven's sakes, Mitt Romney is running for the Senate. So Hillary Clinton said this during an appearance in New Jersey recently. Um, Jared, what do you think? She's back again. It seems like there's always an excuse. She just can't necessarily take responsibility and bow out. And now it does seem like a lot of members of the Democrat Party are like, please go away as they're gearing up for 2018 and 2020. Yeah, that's the kind of funny thing about this is it's not really necessarily just people on the right mm -hmm. and conservatives who want her to go away. I think there's a lot of people on the left who think, you know, you're not the person who necessarily represents our values that much. You've insulted so many voters since the election. You've blamed almost everybody but yourself. Of course, she also recently came out with that book that was about her campaign that, you know, look, she says, oh, the, the buck stops here, but there seems to be a lot of blame on other people. And I think this time now saying that, well, they're going after Hillary Clinton because of sexism. I mean, I think this really reminds people of this comments that she made recently in India, saying that the only reason I wasn't elected is because of you know, intolerant racist people in middle America who are coming from backward places, that everybody who's against her is a malignant person, is a bad person, is terrible for not supporting Hillary Clinton. There's a lot of reasons for not supporting Hillary Clinton, and simple prejudice isn't necessarily one of them. Absolutely, and I think her comment about deplorables really set this off. And yesterday, or Wednesday, um, Dana Perino had one of Hillary Clinton's main communication director on her show. And this person said that when Hillary mentioned deplorables, they knew right then and there it was going to be huge. So at a certain point, it's sort of like a child of lesson, you have to take responsibility and own that you were a terrible candidate and that you made huge mistakes and didn't run an effective campaign. Why can she not accept this? It's an interesting thing because I, I honestly think she should take advice from her husband, Bill Clinton, who was such a good, uh, such a good campaigner. He was so good about making the voters feel like 
he was for them, he was with them. I mean, he, he purported to, to represent a huge amount of people across this country. I mean, in many ways, he pushed her to do more campaigning in places that she just didn't do well in. She should take some advice and stop trashing people who could be potential mm -hmm. supporters of hers and try to win them over with arguments. Why should we support you? It's, is it not? Is it because we're just awful people that we don't support you? Maybe we don't believe in what you have to say. Maybe we don't believe in the policies of your party. Convince people. Stop saying, blaming everybody else for your own problems. Right, and it does. You know, Bill definitely has his own flaws and issues, but it does seem like he has a bit more political strategy. He knows when to retreat in the background, which is maybe something she could learn from. Next up, number six, there is a huge controversy over a 2020 census citizenship question that's causing a lot of discussion. Watch this. This is uh, a question that's been included in every census since 1965, with the exception of 2010 uh, when it was removed. Uh, this is, we've contained this question that's provided data that's necessary for the Department of Justice to protect voters uh, and specifically to help us better comply with the Voting Rights Act, uh, which is something that is important and a part of this process. Uh, and again, this is something that has been part of the census uh, for decades and something that the Department of Commerce felt strongly needed to be included again. So you just saw White House Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders responding to some of this criticism. Now, our colleague at the Heritage Foundation, Mike Gonzalez, wrote an excellent uh, op-ed on this topic about the census citizenship question. Jared, a lot of people will say, oh, it's unconstitutional, there's no historical precedent. Both of those are wrong, as Mike discusses. Thomas Jefferson first proposed it in 1800. In 1820, it was first listed on the census, and in 1950, it did go away. So this is certainly not unprecedented by any means, right? Absolutely not, and it's something that we've we've frequently had on the census. And I and look, this is something that's a very uh, very basic, important question: Are you a citizen? of the United States. I mean, so much that's been proposed for the census is asking questions about your ethnicity or your origins otherwise. I mean, that's something that, that Mike, I think, spoke about very eloquently in his article is that we question so many times what the ethnicity of a person is. This is simply asking, are you an American? Were you, were you born here? Are you a right. citizen of the United States? It doesn't matter what, what ethnicity you are. Are you a citizen of the United States? And it's not asking about legal status either. Right, exactly. And it's, it's not asked about legal status. It's simply trying to get a representation mm -hmm. of how many people living here are citizens of this country. And I think it's something that, look, of course, the left has overreacted to this. California is saying it's going to you know, resist these things. There are probably going to be lawsuits over this. But I think it is a very powerful thing that this has been put on the census. Mm -hmm. And it does, it, honestly, it does help us build a better uh, you know, picture of who's actually in this country, how many people may be you know, illegally in this country. So I think it's a good way to get extra information. I think some of the overreaction to this is a bit absurd. Right, and another colleague of ours, Hans von Spiskowski, wrote an article about this, and I didn't realize this. The UN actually recommends to its member countries that they do ask a citizenship question. That's also a fact that's not really getting a lot of traction, but it should. Absolutely. I mean, look at how much you, I mean, things that you sign up for, things that, uh, how much in daily life you're asking, ask the simple question, are you a citizen of the United mm -hmm. States? It's the same kind of issue that we have with the voter ID problem, you know, when you step into a voting booth, you're expected to show, hey, I'm an actual, you know, I'm a citizen, here I am, here's my ID, I'm going into a voting booth, here's some simple proof. It's a simple thing like that, and it's amazing that there's such resistance now, there's such attacks mm -hmm. as if this is such an awful thing for a person to be asked, are you an American? Were you born here? Were you born in this country? Right. Are you a legal citizen? Very mm -hmm. simple. The left is having a meltdown on this. We're going to keep an eye on it and keep bringing you the facts. Now, number five, this is an overwhelming number. 380 sheriffs in 40 states are telling Congress to build the wall. Take a look. Walls. We started building our wall. I'm so proud of it. We started. We started. We have 1.6 billion. And we've already started. You saw the pictures yesterday. I said, what a thing of beauty. And on September 28th, we go further. And we're getting that sucker built. And you think that's easy? People said, oh, has he given up on the wall? No, I never give up. I never. We have 1.6 billion toward the wall, and we've done the planning, and uh, you saw those beautiful pictures, and that wall looks good. It's properly designed, 
That's what I do is I build. I was always very good at building. It was always my best thing. I think better than being president, I was maybe good at building. All right, that was President Trump. So the wall is back. Jarrett, what do you think? This is a lot of sheriffs who are asking for it to be built. And this was also a very, very important campaign promise. It is a very important campaign promise for Trump. I mean, this is, I mean, if there's anything that people remember from the campaign trail is that he talked about building the wall. And look, this, this comes to, there's a lot of issues that are at stake here. And a big one is simple law and order. Just mm -hmm. simply having a fence on the border. It's not just about keeping every single illegal immigrant from crossing. It's about showing that we're going to be a law-abiding society, that we're going to protect the people, the citizens here, the, both the natural born citizens and the immigrants here. Right. We're going to have a wall. We're going to place it on the border. We're going to take this seriously. Unlike years and mm -hmm. years of neglect of this issue, and so many Americans, in those, especially in those border states, have been basically pleading, hey, mm -hmm. let's get a wall up. Let's make this a safer place, a safer place for our communities. And it's good to see Trump actually taking action. Yeah, it, no, it totally is. And Rob Louie, who's our editor in chief, had a great interview with Sebastian Gorka a couple months ago. And he had a quote that I absolutely love. And he basically said, look, you protect your home with a lock and a front door, right? Why would you not do the same thing with your country? And also, this ties into so many national security issues. The opioid crisis is a huge uh, you know, priority for this administration. A wall ties into a lot of these different issues that we're facing. We've also seen President Trump has made substantial success with MS-13. Uh, He's doing a lot. He is doing a lot, and let's you know, let's hope Congress does mm -hmm. something about this too. Of course, it's going to require funding and things like that. And yeah, you know, look, this is a serious issue for mm -hmm. the American people. You know, they've mm -hmm. been waiting for a long time for us to finally deal with this issue. Right. There's never going to be a perfect solution. There's always going right. to be this problem at the border, mm -hmm. and and I think that's it's reasonable to think that that may to a certain extent continue even after the wall is mm -hmm. built. But having that wall up is it signifies the American people and the people around the around the world. The United States expects its laws to be obeyed, to be respected. Once you stop respecting the laws in a country and allow people to undermine them, it, it calls into question other laws as well. And you know, we are a nation of laws. We live under the Constitution. It's part of what makes America great. It's part of why people want to come here mm -hmm. because we are such a law-abiding society. We believe in the laws as they're passed. And we're, we're a sovereign people who can decide those laws. Here mm -hmm. the people rule and the people want the wall. But they certainly want the wall and it does seem like a perfect solution would be Mexico paying for it. Doesn't look like that's going to happen, but I think above all, his supporters just want the wall to be built. Figure out the funding later. Yeah, I think they mostly just, just want the wall to be built. You know, we spend so much money on so many different things in this country. I mean, we have such a bloated budget. We have so much debt. Wouldn't it be good to actually have this one promise be kept and have the wall, which we can pay for, even if it has to be the United States and not Mexico, we can do this, finally get this done. It shouldn't take this long. No, it certainly shouldn't. We'll keep an eye on that. Number four, Susan Rice has been appointed to the Netflix board. You might remember her from the Benghazi controversy. She went on multiple stations after Benghazi and, and flat out lied. I mean, you can find these clips on YouTube, not just one interview multiple. And what I found interesting about this is President Obama is actually in talks with Netflix to produce several videos. And now she's being put on the board. I don't know. I found this a little weird and I can't believe she's back. It is a little amazing, especially, you know, this is a big tech company mm -hmm. Netflix. A lot of Americans watch this. Liberals, conservatives, everybody around. Of course, Stranger Things, a big Netflix show. and People around the country of all political stripes, all ages like to watch. She's a very partisan figure. I mean, there's no doubt about that. And it is interesting that she's getting involved in documentary making and things like that when she blamed this for essentially the violence and the terrorist act mm -hmm. that took place in Benghazi. I don't know. Does this make you want to watch this network a little less, Jenny? Uh, a little bit. <laughs> and also, documentary making, she can barely tell the truth when she was you know, employed. So I find this absolutely shocking. I also think, sure, she's partisan, but there's a difference between being partisan and telling the truth. Like That's a huge credibility flaw in my eyes. Yeah, sure. And look, maybe she'll do a good job there. Maybe she'll mm -hmm. help them with some things. But it does become, makes one a little suspicious. I mean, we've seen so many reports about Facebook mm -hmm. and Twitter and Google and these companies that people think they're, they're fingers on the button button for one side of the political spectrum. And I think it, it makes people worry, hey, look, Netflix is bringing on somebody who's very much involved with the Obama administration. Are they going to do things that, you know, they're not going to show shows that conservative people want to mm -hmm. watch? Are they, what's, what's their programming going to look like? So, look, I think those, those problems are going to manifest themselves with this, too, unfortunately. I mean, maybe she will do a great job. I just know as more time goes by, it's important to not forget the Americans who lost their lives in Benghazi and her actions afterwards. 
All right, number three, Planned Parenthood wants a Disney princess who's had an abortion. Now, they deleted this tweet, but not before an entire firestorm happened on Twitter. Jarrett, did you see the tweet? I, I did see this tweet, and I couldn't believe it. I know there were even some left-wing sites that were upset about this, saying this was a really silly thing. Because it wasn't just abortion. It was just, we want a Disney princess that's pro-choice. We want Disney to have a princess that's a union worker. Basically, a litany of mm -hmm. left-wing ideas that for a... Children's shows, basically. That's what we're talking about for children's shows. And I, I do find it interesting. I mean, this is Planned Parenthood, an organization that gets all kinds of money from the federal government uh, that's, that's actually pushing this kind of stuff. Isn't that outrageous, Jay? I, I think it's so outrageous because these policy discussions are certainly okay at an adult level. Why would you go after something that's targeted for innocent children? It, it felt like an extreme violation, which is probably why they deleted the tweet. Um, and what I've loved is people like Ben Shapiro now are piling on and kind of sarcastically tweeting back. They certainly walked right into this. They're trying to be all hip and woke and cool. And it definitely backfired. See, this makes me want to go back and watch some of the old Disney shows mm -hmm. because you know maybe those weren't as tied to politics. I mean, hopefully Disney, hopefully Disney won't actually take the bait on this one. I think Disney, you know, isn't going to exactly have a pro-choice <laughs> princess. But at the same time, it does make me kind of appreciate. Mm -hmm. Look, in America, we've had this problem with so many things yeah. getting politicized, including cartoons. We don't want to see that happen mm -hmm. with Disney cartoons. I know they've already been a bit politicized, but the more this happens, I just think it makes things worse. And it makes, frankly, politics and civility with each other a whole lot worse when we have to have even children's cartoons have politics enter the fray in this oh, manner. Absolutely nothing is sacred. What was your favorite Disney movie growing up? You know, I kind of like Pinocchio. It mm -hmm. scared me a little as a kid, but I liked it. So I know I'm mm -hmm. kind of old school with the Disney stuff. How about you, Jenny? I love The Lion King. I think it's a great movie, but I think Pinocchio is really important in terms of moral lessons, and I hope kids keep watching it. So, all right, number two, the U.S. and Russia are back at it. Russia has now retaliated, sort of a tit for tat in terms of diplomatic retaliation. Take a look. Russia should not be acting like a victim. The only victims in this situation are the two victims in the hospital in the UK right now. And the people who cannot go into the park, the medical workers, the first responders who are now having to be, um, you know, be treated and watched carefully because they may have come into contact, contact with that so substance. All right, Jared, so Russia has basically been dealt a serious blow because the U.S. and over 26 other countries have now retaliated for the nerve agent attack that they did against a former double agent who was living in Great Britain. Obviously, Putin's not happy because now they have taken away the exact number of diplomats that we took away from them. and They've also closed a consulate. So I think they might see this as a blow, but in my opinion, nothing's going to take away from the fact that all of these countries have banded together against Russia. Yeah, I think this is what happens when Russia acts now aggressively towards its neighbors. Of course, this war, really mm -hmm. war going on in Ukraine that they precipitated uh, has been going on for years. We have some great analysis from mm -hmm. Nolan Peterson, who's been our guy on the ground there. And Russia's been taking these aggressive actions. And even after this, they've tested a ballistic missile, which they called the, the Satan mm -hmm. missile. Okay. So Russia's been acting very aggressively. And of course, of course, you know, Jenny, the, the narrative from the left is that the Trump administration is working with the Russians, that it's uh, aligned with Putin. But look, this is the Trump administration taking proactive steps, working with allies who see uh, Russia as potentially a threat. You wrote about mm -hmm. this this issue in a recent great piece recently, how the United States is actually really taking that next step and say, we're going to isolate you if you do these aggressive yeah. things. And, and they, we took away 60 diplomats. Most countries were like, oh, maybe three or four. No, we came in with 60 and closed the consulate. To me, that is the Trump administration being super, super strong against Putin, against Russia. And, and it's good to see. I think it's reassuring in this time where Russia thinks that they can get away with absolutely anything. It's also a reminder to never trust Putin. <laughs> That is a, always a good <laughs> lesson. Don't trust Putin. <laughs> we're going to see what happens next. This has been a big story, and we're going to keep following. Now, last and number one, Orange County is revolting. The Sheriff's Department, they're revolting when it comes to immigration and sanctuary cities. Watch this. This is what we are very clearly doing. We're going after very serious offenders who are in custody of our jail and are being convicted of some very serious crimes. SB 54 allows us to notify ICE on those that were under the Trust Act, which was passed in 2014, a previously, previously passed legislation. And that's what we're doing. We're still notifying ICE. The sheriff has that discretion. Last year, we turned over 580. Uh, we had 57,000 bookings, so that's a small percentage, or actually just 58,000. This year, we've already turned over 181. But 244 individuals 
were not turned over to ICE, and that's what we're concerned about. So they're very serious crimes, and they're being returned back into the community, and quite honestly, back to the communities in which they preyed upon and committed their crimes to begin with. So we're trying to help the community be safer by turning these individuals over uh, to ICE and not letting them return to the communities and commit more, uh, commit more crime. So that was a clip from Sean Hannity's show earlier this week. Now, when I first read this, I was a bit surprised because it's California. You're from California, you're from Oakland, and you were explaining to me before the show, perhaps this isn't so surprising after all. Yeah, I think there's kind of a, a negative stereotype about California around the country that it's simply all a bunch of lefty liberals. Mm -hmm. It's the most extreme leftists, and certainly in places like the San Francisco Bay Area and certainly in Los Angeles, there is a lot of leftism, there's a lot of liberals, but there are also a lot of conservatives who live in California who are tired of the regime in Sacramento, who are tired of being really bullied by the politicians mm -hmm. there who have very, very different ideas. Parts of Northern California, uh, especially in this, the free state of uh, Jefferson that they'd like to create there, and certainly Orange County, which has been kind of a bastion of conservatism over the years, they're not happy with the laws that are being passed in the state to try to resist President Trump's immigration ideas. Mm -hmm. And I think this is, this is really coming to a head because California sees itself as the resistance to the Trump regime, to what's going on in Congress. Now there are counties in California that are saying, we don't appreciate the lawlessness that you brought to our state. We're going to pass laws to try to, at the local level, to try to get around what our state is doing. So it does create a very interesting dynamic. You know, don't think of California just as a bunch of lefty mm -hmm. liberals. It is definitely true, but there's some conservatives out there, too, are trying to fight for the rule of law. Yeah, that's, that's so interesting. And do you think it's fair to say that some of these sheriffs in places like Orange County, they look at San Francisco, they see what's happening, and they think, we don't want to be next? Absolutely. I mean, there was this great piece by Ariel Davidson and The Federalist recently talking about this function in San Francisco, how this city that is so opulent and so wealthy has this incredible problem with homelessness, dirty streets, I mean, drug needles everywhere. I mean, this is, this is a serious problem of dysfunction. This shouldn't happen in a place so wealthy and really so well off and privileged as California is. Lives. I mean, it's just a wonderful piece of geography that dysfunctional, bad policies are ruining them, making the state unlivable for a lot of decent middle class people. You know, they talk about, oh, we want to celebrate the immigrants, but you know what? They're not making California a good place in the future for those immigrants to actually rise up in society and make a good good living for themselves in the future. They're making a dysfunctional basket case, and that's a really sad thing compared to what California used to be, the golden state, the place mm -hmm. of opportunity. That's starting to go away. Absolutely, that's so sad. So I've never been to San Francisco. I'm supposed to be going in August to go to a Giants Astros game. So wish me luck. Good <laughs> I'll luck. I'll report back from the <laughs> ground. All right, everyone, thank you so much for joining us this week. Jarrett, thanks for stepping in. Thank you. We'll, ha we'll be back here next week, same time, same place. Have a happy Easter weekend.